to the 31st episode of Moving Forward on the Progressive Radio Network. I'm your host, Rob Simons. On this show, we discuss what is going on in the world and what we can do moving forward. And a couple episodes ago, I had on Matthew Lyons, and I had him on so we could get into discussions about the U.S. and the far-right movements in the U.S., and he gave a great overview of all the different movements there are here in the United States for far right movements. And I know many of these listeners of this show of these shows are very concerned about the environment and rightfully so. That is the issue of our time, but I also believe hand in hand with that is movements, far right movements and the rise of the far right and some and rise of fascism throughout the world. These these issues are interconnected. And what I wanted to do today was have on a guest that is going to get to in-depth analysis about some far-right movements that are happening here in Portland, Oregon, and what the broader implications could mean for us moving forward in the United States. So our guest today is Shane Burley. Shane Burley is a writer film, and filmmaker based in Portland, Oregon. He is the author of Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It. His work has appeared in places such as Truthout, Jacobin, Alternet, In These Times, Political Research Associates, Waging Nonviolence, Labor Notes, Think Progress, Roar Magazine, and Upping the Ante. Follow him on Twitter at Shane underscore Burley One. Shane, welcome to Moving Forward on the Progressive Radio Network. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for coming on the show, and I want to thank uh, Patrick Farnsworth for getting us in touch with one another because I've been wanting to talk to you about these things for a while, and particularly what's happening here in Portland with some of the far-right movements. And it seems like what's really garnered Portland with national attention all stems from, from somebody named Jeremy Christian. So I was wondering if you could talk about the event involving Jeremy Christian here in Portland and his associations with the far right. Yeah, so there's a group uh, in the area called Patriot Prayer. It's sort of a, a what Spencer Sunshine referred to as independent Trumpism, a sort of a, a Trumpian populist group. It's not affiliated with the GOP necessarily. They support Trump, far-right politics, and so on. And they had kind of attracted a number of white nationalist organizations and people around them. Um, so like Identity Europa and other groups in the area had started to linger around them. And so there was started to be a lot of opposition and one of the people that had actually come out to their events was this guy jeremy christian um who was sort of a kind of unhinged character from here uh, people kind of knew him because he used to sell comic books at a, a local street fair um and uh shortly after he had appeared at one event where there was a a, a kind of a sizable counter protest and and the uh, event goers the patriot prayer event goers ended up being shuttled out with uh, uh by the police uh, Jeremy Christian got uh, engaged in kind of a racist rant on uh, public transit, attacking two uh, women for appearing to be Muslim. Um, three men intervened, and he uh, stabbed the three men, killing two of them. Um, so he's uh, basically uh, about to undergo trial for murder, um, and he was a Patriot Pair attendee. And so shortly thereafter, at that attack, um, uh, Patriot Prayer decided to have another public event downtown Portland, and of course, people, although they were already hating Patriot Prayer, really didn't want any anything more to do with them. Yeah, he pushed his way in and got a permit and was holding this event downtown, and uh, that was in summer last year. And basically, about four thousand people came out to to protest that surround the event. And ever since then, uh, um, Patriot Prayers continued to basically push its way into Portland to pick fights, and then expanded out from there. And has done this in kind of liberal cities around the country, uh, forcing protests out and then picking fights with the uh, the residents. So, who is the leader of, or one of the leaders of Patriot Prayers, who seems to keep organizing these events here in Portland? And what are some of Patriot Prayer's ideology that would consider them far right. Yeah, so it's 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 from this guy Joey Gibson, um, who's actually not from Portland. He's from Vancouver, so Vancouver is just over the river into Washington. So it's sort of like a a smaller city uh, that's uh, neighboring Portland, um, and he's been organizing these events um, 
that bring together a number of people. So it's kind of a big tent. But basically, uh, what you're going to see there is a lot of anti-immigrant uh, talk, a lot of homophobia and transphobia, a lot of kind of vulgar, chauvinistic, uh, pro-Americanism, um, really heavy focus on anti-abortion talk. Um, and they basically bring together every reactionary impulse you can have. So they'll react to different things that are happening. Most recently, it's the Me Too movement, especially around the Kavanaugh hearings. So they're holding... Uh, an event that basically props up, you know, quote unquote, all the voices of the men who have been falsely accused of sexual assault and talking about how the Me Too movement hurts men. And so there's various constellations of this. There's not a ton of political content to Joey Gibson. And the reaction to Joey Gibson and Patriot Prayer came largely from the fact that skinheads and neo-Nazis and so on had tagged along and he had to, like basically welcomed them into his ranks without doing anything about it, as well as kind of um, these racist, homophobic, misogynistic street preachers. Uh, but over time, he has basically become the figurehead of it. Um, he brings large crowds in, sets up situations where his crowd can attack counter protesters and in the last year or so he's really made his main constituency the proud boys and so they end up making the largest kind of single organization that's a part of his base that's coming out to his events and they seem to be leading the charge in these street attacks and the proud boys are organized by gavin mcginnis correct and and what are some of the things that gavin mcginnis has said because he's promoted violence against certain uh segments of society is that correct Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he says violence solves everything. So, I mean, Gavin McGinnis, people probably know, was the, the co-founder of Vice, but definitely left there. Vice is not affiliated with him in any way. Um, he's basically gone on to just be a Internet commentator of racist, homophobic, obnoxious banter. Um, Gavin is what you'd call a part of the alt-light, which is sort of the uh, the diet version of the alt-right. If the alt-right are white nationalists, the alt-light refuse to uh, commit fully to those politics, but they definitely creep up into it. And so Gavin McGinnis is really heavily a part of that. And what he wants to do is help prop up essentially a male chauvinist gang of what they call Western chauvinists, which is they say they won't apologize for uh, the West's greatness, um, that they focus on really hard libertarianism, um, on kind of putting women back into uh, homemaker roles, um, traditional gender roles, that kind of thing. And they enforcing a lot of that through violence. And that, that the violence being the really key motivating factor of the Proud Boys, um, that they create bonding, male bonding through violence, that they assert power and will through violence. And that interacts with a lot of white supremacists uh, involved in their movement, but also folks of color. Um, and so what they have is essentially a multiracial far right gang that's going to push up far right events and fight back the left any chance they can get. And they like to defend this as being a form of self-defense, that their situations when they're under attack, but really they're going out into situations, finding situations to attack people and really brutalizing communities. And one thing that I hear Joey Gibson say a lot is that Portland needs to be cleansed and some of these groups like the Proud Boys and Patri Patriot Prayer really believe they're under attack. So what is it, and, and they say it's through feminism, right, and multiculturalism. Are these some of the things that they feel threatened by? I mean, the, the far right is really always motivated by a sense of angst and threat, feeling under attack. Um, and so, like, white nationalism in general is about the idea that whites are under attack, white identity is under attack, and sometimes even the genetics of white people are under attack. With Joey Gibson and Patriot Prayer and the Proud Boys, it's a little broader than that. It's more like, you know, America is under attack or American values and a kind of really vague notion. So, I mean, I think what they feel like is that conservative voices like theirs aren't being respected, that – left-wing ideas have become kind of um, they're growing and they're encroaching on their freedom, quote-unquote, to have their own uh, ideas. They want to be able to come out, to be able to do what they want without any objection whatsoever. And when the community does object, they find that an encroachment on really key rights. And so with with Gibson, it's really unclear sometimes what he even means. He says it's filthy and it needs to be cleansed. Not really sure what he's talking about, but it doesn't really need to mean anything. What it's meant to do is rile up his base and get them into fighting spirit so that they can come out and have events, the purpose of which seems simply to be to fight the left, to show that they won't be intimidated or, or things like that. So they don't even really seem to have strong politics in, in, some, in a certain sense. It, it's more looking to fight and looking to assert their will.
So one thing that also I find interesting is is this balance that the group does is they try to distance them, themselves from quote unquote the alt right, but yet we know Gavin McGinnis has connections with Richard Spencer. Um, I was recently reading a article in Commune magazine where somebody went undercover in the alt right for three months in New York, and basically they said that the Proud Boys said, "Hey, look, we agree with the alt right, just not in public. Can't say anything in public about it." So, how are they able, or do you think they're able to walk this line of distancing themselves, but yet this big tent approach is still happening? I mean, conservatives have done this for decades. Um, they're very adept at doing this. And I think with, with the alt-light, what they do is use the language of civic nationalism rather than white nationalism, which allows them to recruit just past just, just white folks. But also, it, it just creates a lot of plausible deniability. And with Trumpism and right populism in general, there is a lot of plausible deniability. We're not talking about immigrants. We're talking about illegal immigrants. We're not talking about women. We're talking about false allegations. We're not talking about uh, queer people. We're just talking about the queer lifestyle or transgenderism, quote unquote. So what they're trying to do is to distance the, the real practical implications of what they're saying from the language that they're using. And Joey Gibson does this perfectly. You know, like I will watch, because I'll be at these events, I cover these events, right? And I'll watch Joey Gibson kind of laugh and egg people on into violence and then immediately go to his phone and talk into his phone in a live stream about how he just wants to have his march and he doesn't understand where all this violence is going. Then he'll put down his phone and continue on with it. So, I mean, this is, it's such a disingenuous kind of act, but it works because it creates a lot of ambiguity about what they're really saying and who's responsible for it. And um, one other question I had was, since you are up and cl up close to these events and I've followed you on Twitter and you're right there when they're giving their speeches, taking pictures and, and recording things that are happening during these rallies. Now, in the past, when we'd see somebody that was a neo-Nazi or they exercised racist ideology, they wore a white hood and robe. Are there different symbols that we see now with this, these groups that you can look at and spot and say that is neo-Nazi ideology or that is white supremacist, white nationalist ideology? Sure, there are. I mean, there's there's logos for Identity Europa um, or our different organizations. There's a lot of new ones in the last couple of months since certain ones collapsed. I, I, I hesitate, though, to focus too much on that because people really love to identify symbols and say that means X, Y, and Z. But the problem is that, one, people tend to misidentify them pretty regularly. And also – there's a lot of ambiguity about what the symbols mean and who the people are doing them. So, for example, the Blue Lives Matter, people have probably seen this. It's like a American flag, but it's got, like, blue, white, and black, and it's supposed to be, like, um, sort of, like, in response to Black Lives Matter, we support the police. Now, I think that's pretty clearly a white supremacist symbol, but it's also used by segments of the more beltway conservative right. Now, those people are likely racist, too, if they're using this symbol, but they're not part of a white nationalist movement, necessarily. So it's a little bit harder to identify, and I think when you're in the Patriot Prayer type crowd, you're going to see a lot of these more ambiguous symbols that I think should be suspect, but they're not always an indication of an organized white supremacist movement. Um, and so... I think it's a little bit more difficult to rest our ability to find these people on those symbols. That being said, I think the most common thing that people should identify in those circles is what a proud boy is. And that's generally um, with a Fred Perry shirt, polo shirt that's uh, black and gold. And I think that's the, the thing that uh, because they're so responsible for violence and they operate like a gang and it might be hard to pick them out of a crowd without that. And I think sometimes it's just as easy as reading some of these shirts. I remember in the August rally of this year when I saw somebody wearing a shirt that said, Pinochet did nothing wrong. Um, that tells you everything you need to know. There, there was I saw another uh, guy who was protesting, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of Portland, and he had a, an orange shirt on that said, I hunt Antifa cowards. So yeah. you kind of have an idea, and I agree with you that the thing that I – appreciate what Antifa does is not only do they stand up to these people, but the research they do. Uh, I saw that Rose City Antifa, the local Antifa group around here, put out an article of the Him Too rally, and they did background research on everybody that is part of this rally or some of the key players. And 
one thing they noticed was a history of violence. I mean, what type of violence are we seeing from some of these people that is on maybe a criminal record or, or a police report? Yeah, yeah, and I also want to say that, like, with Rose City and Tiefen, a lot of those organizations, they have an unimpeachable record of good research, and I think it's really dependable, and it's a testament to the the long-standing work people do and to have credible evidence of things. Um, one of the things is, so, like, people probably know that Portland has a long history of white supremacist skinhead violence, um, and in the 80s and 90s, there was a really large growth of skinhead gangs, and then later Volksfront was founded out here. And while those things have, have declined for, for a lot of reasons, one of which being the, the organizing that people have done in response, um, those people didn't go anywhere. And so there's still a large portion of those people here. Um, and they find avenues to get into the culture where they can. And they find that around Trump and they find it around Joey Gibson. And so what we're seeing in the Proud Boys, we're seeing it in the militia movement in the area, and we're seeing it just in the kind of stragglers, is there's a lot of people with a long history of A, white supremacist violence, and B, just violence in general. Um, and so you're, you're, when you're doing Doing the research on these people, you're finding a lot of people with obviously criminal records, which I don't want to uh, make the issue too much. I think it's their actual conduct, which is a lot of interpersonal violence, a lot of domestic violence, um, and just a real history of interpersonal complications. And I think that in a large part, that's what part of what can draw them into this movement is that they find a space where their violence or their impulse towards violence has been validated. And there's been strategic avenues that Joey Gibson has taken in order to really help incite violence. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you about was going back to a little bit with Jeremy Christian and what happened with him is it seems that violence started exploding into the streets of Portland shortly after that. What were you seeing when you were observing those events after Jeremy Christian's arrest? I mean, I was seeing the far right showing up and antagonizing the community as much as possible. Um, so let's think about what with Jeremy Christian. So he shows up, we show up to have this event about three weeks after the stabbing takes place. Nobody wants it. No one thinks that this would be a good idea, even if you were sympathetic to Patriot prayer. So why come? Well, it's coming because they're going to show that no one's going to tell them no, which to a community of mourning after this really, really tragic, uh, uh, brutal murder, um, no one wants, but they come anyway. They push their way into the community anyway. At any one of these events, they edge off as much as possible. They will, you'll watch them stand behind police lines and antagonize people screaming homophobic and racist things. They'll then take their march and turn it directly to march into the counter protesters. They come and prepare people to attack people. They're coming suited up in body armor with helmets with a, like a, basically security squadrons. They're sending out scouts to go see where people are. I mean, this is very, very, very intentional stuff. Um, and so, so there is a lot of narratives about how there's essentially two groups fighting each other in the streets. And that is absolutely not the case. There is the community of the city who's coming out and protesting and refusing to allow them space. And then there's Jeremy Christian, I mean, sorry, uh, Joy Gibson and Patriot Prayer coming in and marching into those crowds ready to fight and literally attacking people. And then some of these most violent confrontations, there's lots of cameras on them, right? These are big media spectacles. You can see Patriot Prayer people and Proud Boys especially just running up and organize, openly attacking people, brutalizing them on the ground, gang beating them, um, really injuring people. You know, when I went back after uh, one of the, the confrontations this last summer, there's blood all over the streets from when the, uh, the Proud Boys came and attacked people. So I, I think, like, what I'm seeing is uh, Patriot prayer as a movement that is coming in with the intention of bringing violence into the community to basically prove their point through violence. And they have the resources to bring people from all over the country that come into these events, too, from what I've read. They have some resources. I mean, the Proud Boys are coming in from all around the country. I wouldn't want to overstate their amount of money. They're not rich, but they definitely are organizing to bring people in from out of town. This is mostly people from out of town. This is not really people from Portland. They're busing in from Vancouver, which is a slightly more conservative area to the north. They are bringing people from rural parts of the state. But, you know, like there's times when they're bringing Proud Boys from over a dozen other states. So they really are bringing people from around the country, and they crowdfund to fly people in. And it looks like right now Joey Gibson's crowdfunding for a new car, which I saw uh, that he posted on a, a GoFundMe. Is that correct? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he does this pretty regularly. He's he's not doing well financially, um, which is what you would expect when you made a spectacle of yourself like this. So he's he's trying to get a new car this way. And it was in June, from what I looked at, that look, Portland looked like a war zone after that was done. And I saw yeah. a video from Alexander Reed Ross where he came in and literally probably saved somebody's life. That whoever it was, the guy was getting his head kicked in. Alexander Reed Ross tries and grabs the guy off the pile and someone sucker punches him in the face then. And that's all on video. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're all standing next to each other. It's Jason Wilson's there, uh, uh, Sasha Alexander, uh, a number of other reporters from town. And, um, you know, they, they're descending on people, right, in groups to bring them down, kicking people, stomping on their heads, um, totally unrestrained, brutal violence. There's nothing self-defense about this. Um, and they're, they're intentionally trying to injure people and then celebrating those injuries after the fact. And I think this comes to there's some debate I see on the left and it, the debate is with Antifa and, you know, their tactics. And is it what, what I've been hearing Chris Hedges on the talk circuit with his new book and talking about how Antifa is a gift to the right. And you can you, you can also combine that with this other question about, you know, if we just ignore Patriot Prayer and Proud Boys, then they'll stop doing this. They do this for attention and Antifa's feeding their attention. And they have a right, you know, Patriot Prayer and these far right groups, we may not agree with what they say, but they have a right to speak because it's freedom of speech. And if we suppress their speech, then soon our speech gets suppressed. Now, I think our speech is already suppressed, um, but I'm wondering this whole debate about how to counteract with Patriot Prayer and, and Antifa's role. What is your thoughts about that when you hear those type of debates going on? Sure, sure. So there's there's a few things here. One is is Chris Hedges, who, who never misses an opportunity to criticize the left. Um, yet, really, I think we need to think about where these criticisms are coming from. Are they coming from a place of experienced organizing, or are they coming from a, the far distant? So this idea that... Um, Antifa, whatever he thinks that means, which I think is ambiguous, is a gift to the right. I think Chomsky said something similar. Um, that misunderstands how organizing works fundamentally. It understands organizing to be something purely of optics as controlled by the right. But the reality is that the appearance of leftist protesters in right-wing media does not determine the success of those protests. And that's, that's just a simple fact. Now, there's something to be said for the way that the general conversation in the public goes. And I think that's important for organizers to consider. And I think uh, being reckless is always a poor choice. But the fact of the matter is what is generally successful is stopping organizations like that from the, being able to recruit and expand and to have that space and platform. And so this idea that winning is simply exactly how neutral, quote unquote, neutral media observes it, it's just not the case. And I don't think it has a really clear understanding of how organizing works. Then there's this question of free speech, and I think this is a complete red herring. I have never heard any anti-fascist organizer or leftist protester argue that, well, not in general, not people who are part of the organizations, argue that Joey Gibson and, the, and Patriot Prayer should be legally disallowed from speaking. I wouldn't argue that. I think that's a really poor idea. Um, and I don't think that's generally the thrust of it. The idea of free speech, the free speech is a concept. It's a reaction to the state intervention in speech. So we're generally against laws that would limit speech based on the content of the speech. That's not the same as a community accepting speech or allowing it to go over without objection. And that's what we're talking about here, whether or not speech is going to be objected to in public. Um, and frankly, Patriot Prayer doesn't have any right to have unobjected speech. He doesn't, they don't have the right to come in and not have to deal with the consequence of that speech. Um, and so I think, again, that's, that's completely misreading the situation. I'm really hesitant to listen to these voices that criticize anti-fascist protesters without having a base in doing the work at all and also don't seem to have a stake in whether or not that work is successful. Um, and so when someone like Chris Hedges basically banks their credibility on criticizing leftist protesters, I don't see a lot of all 
alternatives be presented. And this idea that, like, well, let's just come in with better arguments, that functionally doesn't understand and how politics works, and it doesn't understand how the far right actually grows. What would give them a gift is to give them a platform to debate their uh, issues, not because it, they would win that debate necessarily, they probably wouldn't, but because all they need is to be, have an opportunity to state them, to gain recruits, to find people that speak to them. Uh, most people aren't just won over by rational debate. They're won over when people appeal to ideas they've been thinking or things they're feeling and that kind of thing. And so we have to actually think about how the far right grows and if people want to counter that, that involves bringing masses of people out, overwhelming them, and trying to take back that space to a degree. And I think that's what's important. I think instead of just taking like Chris Hedges' criticism on face value, we come back and say, instead, actually, I think what's, what's really effective is popular movements with lots of people involved talking about the issues, coming out, showing their opposition, and basically making a statement about how Portland isn't just going to be overrun by the far right whenever they feel like it. And I think civil debates, like you're saying, you have – televised debates or pu public events where there's debates like that is is almost normalizing that speech too which is what concerns me is this isn't norm this shouldn't be normalized speech and it it almost when i look at that too it's it's like you were saying i agree with what you're saying but on top of that is understanding how power works power doesn't always work through words it works through force and that's what they're trying to do is use force to gain power and mm -hmm. I think that Antifa is doing great work by combating that and protecting some of the marginalized people that they would like to go after. And if they had the means and if there wasn't people there to stop them, there would maybe be more attacks um, for their cleansing, yeah, as they call it. This idea that ignore them and they go away is empirically untrue and a dangerous thing to keep propping up. And I find it really kind of unacceptable that arrogant wealthy journalists like to sit back on blogs and argue that the people who are really affected that are facing violence that are being attacked should just go home and wait it out yeah yeah it sounds like a very privileged position to take right and i, and I think there's a lot of i think criticisms to be leveled at all kinds of things in organizing and i you know no one should really revel in like a celebration of conflict and things like that i don't think that's good but organized uh resistance that comes out that shows opposition is effective it brings the community together it gets people engaged it creates a, a much more safe space for people and i think that's actually really important um organized resistance organized um responses to the far right is what works it's what's going to be needed in the future and people should start now if they want to actually see those things have results and also they help fight for people that are too afraid to come out. And I saw that with Occupy ICE uh, here in Portland, that there, there was people that said, look, there are some undocumented people that would love to come out here and show their support, but they're too afraid to. And I think it's important that people take that into account and look at people that are willing to, to step out for those populations that maybe are too afraid to because they're too mar marginalized. Sure, sure, sure. I think that was definitely true in the, the ICE encampments around the country. So now with with I, I wanted to talk specifically about the August 4th rally that happened this year, because there was some strategic decision from Patriot Prayer on having this rally at the Tom McCall Waterfront Park. Why was there reasoning for for having it there and how did it benefit the far right from from holding the rally at that location? Why did it benefit them to have it there? Yeah, wasn't there a permitting issue with weapons? Where yeah. They something yeah, they like to use this federal park a lot that's a little bit more downtown. So people probably don't know the geography of, of Portland. So Portland, um, the downtown area is is on the west side and it's broken off from the east side by a river and so in the very dense downtown which will have a lot of the kind of skyscraper buildings it's really the only part of town that does um there's a federal park that they like to get a permit for and have their rallies at and there was an issue permitting there and so they wanted to move over to the tom mccall waterfront park which is basically a very long park at one end of the downtown area that banks up against the waterfront 
a lot of people go there and ride bikes and, and there's like, you know, they'll have music festivals and things like that. And so they wanted to do that. It's a little bit more open access. People can get in and out easier and they wanted to have access to that space. Also a federal park is essentially weapons restricted. You can't bring a gun in there. And in Oregon, there's very, you know, loose gun laws. So people could bring guns where they want. Um, and so they wanted access to that space. And so, Essentially, what they got permission to do was have access to the space if and have it not be like a checkpoint if they agreed to have it be a guns free space. And so what they did was bank up against the waterfront in a certain area that was kind of cordoned off, though you could walk in and out if you wanted. Um, and technically, that was supposed to also be space for the opposition protests, which they knew would also be in the space. You know, each group has access to these spaces because they're public spaces. Um, that ended up not being the case, and the sort of much larger anti-fascist contingent was not allowed into that space. And there was something that happened. I was at that event, and I saw the police fire tear or, or flashbang grenades on the counter protesters, and I didn't see anything that provoked them to do that. And I know you were probably closer to where the meeting points were between the far right groups and then the counter protesters. I, I was actually during that. I was with Patriot prayer. Okay. And what, yeah. did, what did you see from your vantage point when you were there? Well, so, so I think just to set context. So we have the waterfront park. It's on the West side. And then there was a rally, um, by an organization called, Pop Mob for Popular Mobilization. It was basically a coalition of groups, uh, labor unions, community groups, some nonprofits, different things. And they were all rallying at the city hall, which is a little bit more central than downtown. And then they were going to meet up with other uh, protesters, maybe more militant groups. And then they all march as a big group down to the waterfront. And so they all, that, that happens, they have the rally, they, they kind of coalesce, and then they do a big march down the streets, about 2,000 people. And they march up the get to the waterfront to basically take their spot in the park that they thought was going to be there for them. And they're blocked off by the police. And it's a really huge police presence. You know, it's like riot cops blocking it off. And so they kind of just stay there um, and kind of move, maybe move back and forth along the roads, but they don't cross what is essentially a parkway that would let them into the park where Patriot Prayer is. They don't cross that. And so they just kind of stay there and uh, continue rallying. And so, a couple hours go by and eventually there was some kind of brief warnings about like, oh, you should disperse, but we're talking about 2000 people and a March on a roadway. Um, and so eventually without much prompting, the police just start firing tear gas and other um, quote unquote, less lethal ammunition into the crowd. Um, doesn't seem to be particularly um, warranted. There wasn't an, like a trigger that seemed to happen uh, that indicated it, but then they started firing pepper balls uh, flash grenades, um, and ended up injuring very seriously a number of people who were just either kind of walking away or, or moving with the crowd. I saw, I was pretty far, I was probably about a block, block and a half away when they started firing those flashbang grenades. And I was walking further away. They were coming towards us. They were still firing them. And um, I saw somebody next to me. They must have got hit with it or it bounced off like the flashbang grenade must have bounced off a building or the sidewalk or something and hit them in the face. Cause they were bleeding uh, everywhere. Yeah. And it, and to think about that, that's how far away the Portland police were firing these away or firing these at people that could have been blocks away. Some of these people could not have even had anything to do with the, the event that was happening. We're just downtown for other things and we're at risk of getting hit by some of these flashbang grenades. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, like, some of the people being hit were had already complied with even the vague police suggestions, you know, they're on the sidewalk, or they're walking away, or whatever. And, and you know, people, so so people are hit with a flash grenade. People maybe don't have a sense of what a flash grenade is, but it's essentially, like, a, a fire-starting grenade that will melt flesh and plastic and things. It's very aggressive, um, and it can kill people. Um, the idea is that it, it disorients the crowd, so when, you know, when they descend on the crowd of people, we're talking about things being fired from every direction, sounds echoing off buildings, there's lights flashing, you don't know where you are. Um, and so 
even if people are being asked to comply, it's next to impossible to see them do that when you're firing flash grades at them. So a number of people are very hurt. Um, uh, the partner of a reporter here in town was very seriously injured. Um, another person like had, uh, you know, like the skin melted off in their arm. One person had a flash grenade hit their bicycle helmet and melt into it. Uh, cracking open their head, they had to go to the hospital. Um, like it's it's really really dangerous stuff. And what was the police chief Daniel Outlaw's response to the criticism waged by her department for initiating these types of measures to the counter protesters? Uh, her response was to go onto right wing media, right wing uh, talk radio, and say that uh, protesters is mad because they kicked our butts. And. I'm wondering if you could go into kind of the dynamic between her and and Ted Wheeler, because Ted Wheeler, it seems like, has been a little bit more hands off with these. Right. And, and is letting her take the lead. I guess it's hard to say. That's the appearance a lot of people seem to have. Um, but they, on the flip side, Patriot Prayer accuses Ted Wheeler of moving the police against them. I don't think there's a lot of evidence of that, but it's basically that's that's the claim made from the right. Um I think Ted Wheeler has kind of instituted aggressive policing measures ever since his tenure. Essentially, you have to think like he kind of came into being mayor at a time when there was a massive upsurge in protests around Trump. And I think what he's trying to do is make examples of people and to target uh, protesters so that um, he doesn't get constant protests during his time running the city. Um, so, for example, the protests directly after the election in 2016, there was very aggressive uh, prosecuting of people involved and really pretty petty vandalism around uh, protests. Stuff that's actually pretty common when you have five, six, seven thousand people out in the streets. Um, I think all of this has meant to send a message that in this liberal city, he's not going to tolerate it. And I think he's he's allowing for the same thing here. Um this is not the first act of aggressive policing against leftist protesters. So on that day when uh, Joey Gibson brought out his people, despite everyone's objections shortly after the murders and 4,000 people came out in objection, what did the police do? Well, they attacked protesters, not Joey Gibson. Um, and they attacked the, the, the kind of opposition community protesters. Um, same thing happened this time. And every time it happens, Patriot Prayer is standing there with the Proud Boys cheering them on and yelling about how great this is. And so what it seems like because there's a general trend to go after the protesters who cause the police the most trouble. And what I mean by the most trouble is occupying the most space and stopping traffic and things like that, which is always necessarily the leftist protesters because there's more of them and because they're kind of overwhelming the streets in a traditional march, which is actually quite disruptive to to kind of business as usual. So it seems like what Outlaw and Wheeler are doing is using a, a metric that really is only used against the left and isn't, and while they're talking a lot about defending people against violent confrontations, they're not actually creating a system that goes after Patriot Prayer and the Proud Boys who actually seem to be initiating the violence from, from, from what I've seen. And I think what gives that impression too, that she's kind of running the show on her own is, one thing she said about the Occupy ICE encampment, that it was her decision to clear that of the protesters. And what we found out after the August 4th events with Patriot Prayer and the counter protesters, where there was, they've, they revealed that there was weapons, they held weapons up on roofs of buildings over the protest. So does, has Ted Wheeler spoken about that? Has he said that he was aware of that? I mean, that seemed to be a really big sticking point of anger once that was found out because it was pretty far after that event if i'm correct right it wasn't found out after the event but it was released far after the event basically on the same day that they were disallowed to bring firearms into the waterfront park um they had positioned some people on a nearby parking garage roof with guns appearing like snipers and police found them there made them put them away basically and that was that and they didn't really reveal it i think that there's been i i, I think that they didn't realize the implications of it didn't bring it up and thought that it would be a bigger issue if they had brought up i don't think i think there's been a lot of hedging around it and a really unclear messaging from the city and from the police department but in general yeah they, they play real kids gloves with patriot prayer and they see their bringing of weapons 
as less serious than whatever the leftist protesters might be doing. And their their way of of trying to combat some of these issues with protests here in Portland is I saw that you wrote a piece about them increasing their restrictions about that with a new ordinance. Ordinance. Could you go over what that new ordinance is that Ted Wheeler's trying to propose or have yeah, proposed? Look at, yeah. So so basically, um, what it's meant to do is to give police um, extended powers in the ability to cancel a protest. And what, what they mean by cancel, I think, is a little ambiguous. I think it should be read a little bit ominously because canceling a protest means <laughs> dispersing people, which means the use of dispersal methods, which is like flash grenades and pepper balls. Um, but basically, um, they can use a certain metric, and that metric is essentially um, it's supposed to be used a when two groups are protesting in opposition to one another. So. I think that that this is clearly meant to indicate patriot prayer and then counter protesters, but it could also mean like, um, uh, you know, if right to life is out there and then um, pro-choice protesters are counter protesting, that kind of thing. Um, and that in those instances, they can have um, greater leeway to cancel the protest if they feel like those groups are coming into contact with one another, if they're blocking traffic, if they're um, basically disallowing normal functionings of the cities, which again, um, is a metric that can be disproportionately used against the counter, the leftist counter protesters because of the numbers that they bring out, because of the fact that they have large scale protests that march and because that they're coming in response to another group. Therefore they're on the fringes of the other group, which means it pushes them out into more uh, broad space like roads and parks. Um, and so by the very nature of the way it's been constructed, it would actually target one group over the other. And that's even to ignore just the disproportionate use of policing on marginalized communities, which are disproportionately in the counter protesters. Um, and so it, the basically the impetus for this is acts of violence. They want to stop acts of violence, but it feels disingenuous when they're not doing anything to uh, a target specifically the, the growth of Patriot prayer and proud boy violence, which is basically operating like gang violence and happening even outside of protest spaces. But also they're not going after any systemic issues in Portland, which there's still a problem with police violence uh, and police brutality. Um, there's still a problem with racist violence in general, and there's still a problem with the growing inequality and attacks on houseless people as gentrification and housing prices skyrocket. So where do you see all this heading as far as when we look at politicians now that have white nationalist policies in their platforms. You know, I saw that you recently wrote a piece for Truth Out on Chris Kobach, even though he was defeated as the gubernatorial candidate for Kansas. There's him. There's, of course, Donald Trump. There's Representative Steve King from Iowa, who's called immigrants dirt. And then there's the uh, neo-Nazi candidate that was in Illinois, the congr con uh, congressional candidate, Arthur Jones, who received 56,000 votes, even though he lost. Where do you see this trending? I think that there's uh, there, there has been a mainstreaming of white nationalism, even while ni white nationalists have seen recently an increase in marginalization. So actual white nationalists, open white nationalist movements have taken a really big hit over the last year, basically since Charlottesville, both because of the platforming on social media and their different publishing platforms, as well as the fact that they can't really have public events without um, really large scale protests that kind of disallow their functioning. Um, but their their ideas have still had a lot of traction and have moved into the GOP much more forcefully. This is kind of what we call the quote-unquote alt-light, uh, the people that get, have a certain amount of plausible deniability because of the language that they use. Um, I think that we're gonna there's an increase in that sector in the GOP. Um, and I'm just talking about the U.S., but this is an international problem. But that those things are going to continue to grow in those areas and certain parts of the alt-light and even certain parts of white nationalist communities are going to try and find cover in the GOP or by aligning with the GOP. And so um, while they do function differently, I think it's really important that if people are going to want to confront white nationalism, that they broaden out and they talk about people like uh, Steve King, Chris Kobach, and a number of other politicians, especially at the local level, that are trying to enact white nationalist policies and really uh, target immigrants, specifically uh, immigrants of color, Muslim immigrants, people from south of the border, um, and uh, as well as uh, trans rights, um, abortion rights, and things like that. That needs to be part of a full spectrum understanding of how, how fascist politics 
politics works and how organizing intersectionally and across a lot of different kind of sub areas is really going to be important and needs to be coordinated. And I think that even um, even though some of these people lost, like uh, Arthur Jones and Chris Kobach, what I see is what uh, one of my friends of the show, Yav Lifton, has said is it's it's like a trial balloon. That even though they lost, they're floating out these ideas just to see what the reaction is. And that we need to recognize that when we see that happening. Because it's happening a lot, not only with some of these politicians that are running from our own president as well. He floats out trial balloons. I mean, you look at what happened with the CNN reporter where he's banning him now from the White House. To me, that's a trial balloon on seeing if he could restrict the freedom of press. I think these are things that we need to pay attention to as they're happening. And you've been covering all of this stuff. You've been writing about it. I mean, you have a book about fascism. Um, what I'm wondering is all the research you've done and all of your on the ground experience that you have, what, have, what do you see that is effective in tactics against some of these ideologies and movements from the far right? Um. Well, I feel like I need to hedge a little bit because, in, in a sense, it's doing something is the first most important thing. I think what's really effective is large mass movements in response to it, ones that use a whole range of tactics and approaches, also use a lot range of institutions we already have to confront it. But I think what's most important is finding a place for everyone in that form of resistance to come out, to basically shut down those things, um, to basically create large mass community participations into projects that don't just go after shutting down an event, but go much, much further and keep going and keep confronting that threat as it grows. I think we need to focus on immigrate or um, immigration support to support immigrants being targeted to create community defense and, and response networks to really support families that are being subjected to this. I think we need to defend abortion clinics and abortion providers. I think we need to uh, be active in supporting trans rights and really creating a sense of community safety around that. I I think that all of this is going to require coordinated effort and it's going to require a real mass participation that doesn't just see it as a one-off event because it's not a one-off event. This is an ongoing issue that's going to really require really large scale buy-in. Um, and so I think what's going to change this over the next few years, if we have any opportunity at all, is just to find a place for everybody in our community to get them involved at the local level and coordinating at the national and international level. Uh, I know this is kind of a big question, um, and you, we could spend a whole another hour talking about this, but I, we're kind of getting towards the end. And I wanted to ask you this, just for listeners that are listening to this show, is when you look at this, and we, this is something you and I talked about before I put the recorder on, was that um, we can link climate change to far-right movements. Mm -hmm. And when you do your research and you write some of your pieces on some of these far right figureheads or movements, how do you see that linked to climate change? I, I, I it's a number of different ways. Uh, the far right develops out of a real crisis of the existing status quo. It's not just a, a, a tool of the rich. It includes lots of voluntary areas of the uh, white working class, the working class broadly, that's attempting to, to hold on to the privilege that it has, that's attempting to gr regain some kind of stability, and it's blaming essentially immigrants and, and marginalized communities for issues that are actually the responsibility of uh, large corporate systems. And so... In times of crisis, you see that rise, and I think what we're seeing is maybe the biggest point of crisis in climate change and the increase in a very catastrophic instability. Um, and the same thing, too, is, as capitalism starts to implode on itself uh, through kind of unregulated neoliberalism, it really is finding a, a lot of instability in how it props up the workers in that system. And so I think climate change as providing maybe the, the biggest impetus for social collapse is going to increase the rates of, of basically fascistic movements that are rising to try and um, be a way of coping with that crisis. And so I think if we want to take seriously how we're going to deal with climate change, we're also going to have to take seriously how we deal with the consequences of climate change. And the growth of the far right is going to be kind of inherent to it as we, for example, see increases in fires and political instability, um, lack of resources, uh, food prices going up. There's all kinds of elements that are part of this that I think are going to end up driving elements of the populist far right and, and even the fascist right. I completely agree with you. And 
I think that the, the thing we must recognize is that we are, this is also a resource issue, climate change is, is resource depletion. And someone, there's always going to be pointed blame at that resource depletion or that large wealth inequality gap that we're experiencing now more than ever. And they're pointing the blame at other segments of society. And I think one of the biggest things, I, I listened to this interview from uh, Gabor Mate. It was him and Russell Brand. And it was a really good interview because they both were talking about addiction and they both have had addiction issues in their lives. And one thing that, that Dr. Mate said that I totally agree with is looking at nationality as an addiction and that it, it, it's a form of addiction because it lets these people that are into this white nationalism and into some of our nationalities, you know, as far as Western chauvinists and Western way of life is that it makes them feel like they belong to something and that nationality, I feel like right now is, is getting in the way of our humanity and it doesn't let us understand our common humanity. And we need to make sure that we do that, that we break through the, the na these nationalistic barriers and reach people in a common way through our humanity from human to human. And I think that's so important to look at is that type of mindset as this is all going on in the background with climate change because it's not going away, it's going to continue to get worse as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think we really need to reclaim a certain kind of cosmopolitanism and internationalism and, and understand that false identities like race and nation are what kind of limit us from our ability to create true solidarity and build the world we want to see. I, I, I agree with you. And I think, Shane, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I think that's a perfect way to end this show. And I definitely in the future would love to have you on again as these things continue to evolve so people can be up to date with what's happening uh, here in Portland and, and other places really in the country with when it comes to far right movements. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to be on again. Well, that's all the time we have today for moving forward. I again would like to thank Shane Burley for coming on the show. You can find this episode and all episodes of Moving Forward podcasted at Podbean or in the archives at prn.fm or on the Progressive Radio Network's app, which is available for Android and Apple products. If you'd like to find more of my work, you can go to my website, which is robmovesforward.wordpress.com, or you can go to counterpunch.org. And I also created a Medium profile if you want to find my work there. So thank you for listening to Moving Forward on the Progressive Radio Network.